As I mentioned, we'll be in Hebrews chapter 4. We're going to look at verses 14 through verse 16 today. And I wanted to just take, uh, again, some more time. This, this, we're walking through this four weeks of what is the gospel. So if you've been here, you kind of are kind of maybe catching up to speed. But if you haven't, kind of quick review. So we're, we're looking at this bigger picture of this, this term in Christianity that we use to describe the story of God, which is this word, the gospel, which means good news. And so the last couple of weeks, the first week, we talked about what is the gospel in terms of it's the bigger picture of human history and God's story unfolding throughout all of human history of God reconciling everyone and all things back to him through Jesus to be in this relationship that he created us for. Then the second week, last week, we talked about kind of our side of the story, which was kind of the common things that we do as human beings that distance or separate us from God, and how God, through Jesus, brings us back once again to him. And so today, I want to take a few minutes to just talk about, there's a context or environment that God has set up for us to fully embrace a relationship with him, or to fully live out the gospel in our lives, that many times we we miss or we get a portion of it, but we don't get all of it. And it's the key to understanding how we relate to God and how God relates to us. And so this morning, we're going to take some time to do that. So let me read these few verses, and then we'll take some time to talk about this context that God has set up for us to really embrace the gospel in a relationship with him. So the writer of Hebrews says in verse 14 of chapter 4, Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. So, quick little history lesson, because it's important. Most of us don't come with a thousands of year old mindset of a Jewish culture which understood the way they related to God so many places in the Old Testament was through a sacrificial system that required for human beings to relate to God in their broken state. There had to be a sacrifice made on their behalf in order for their sin to be paid for so they could relate once again rightly to God. So in the Old Testament, what was set up is that once a year, one person, the high priest, would go into the holiest place in the temple and would sacrifice an animal on behalf of all of Israel to atone or to cover their sins so that they would once again be in right relationship with God. What the writer of Hebrews tells us is now we actually have a high priest that's even better than that because the high priest himself being Jesus not only wasn't just offering a sacrifice, he was the sacrifice for us. And it wasn't a sacrifice that has to happen over and over and over again. It happened once. And in that one sacrifice was the coverage for all of sin, for all of time, for all of humanity. And that was through Jesus. And the beauty of this high priest is that he was a human just as we are human. And he was tempted just as we are tempted, yet he was perfect. So he's the role model for us. So in verse 16, which we'll land in in just a little bit, there's the context that God has created for us to understand the gospel. And it comes in two simple phrases that if you've been in church, you have heard these, you have sung these, you have read these in your lifetime. And they are the words mercy and grace. Not just mercy, not just grace, mercy and grace. The easiest way to understand those two terms, which are really, they are opposite sides of the same coin that go together, is that mercy is best understood in one simple word. It's the word pardon. And the word pardon is what we understand in our culture. So, uh, you know, Obama's going to get out of office at the end of this year, and probably what he's going to do is like every president has done before him, or governors, governors do this too, is when they're leaving office, they want to they get some good kudos on the way out the door. So what do they do? They look for people to pardon. We call it clemency. And that is not finding people that are innocent, that got wrongly accused. It's finding people who are guilty that you offer a pardon, which means you cover their sentence or the payment for their infraction or the law that they broke. It's a, that's, what, that's what mercy is. So God comes along through Jesus' sacrifice, and he gives us a pardon for our past. For all the points of sin and brokenness throughout our lifetime, we get this pardon. But It would be great if that's where you ended, but it wouldn't be really enough in terms of really understanding and following and knowing Jesus and experience a relationship because the other side of the coin is grace. And what is grace? In its simplest form, grace is a gift. And it's a gift that's given to us that you can't earn, that you can't work for, that you can't make happen. It's just God's choice that he extends grace to us because on one side he uses mercy to cover our past and then gives us grace for our future. 
You cannot separate the two, although we try really hard to do that. And what we got to come up with is we come up with an incomplete faith. So I want to take just a few minutes to talk about what that looks like. I think there's this tension that we live in, and we go to the extremes, and we never find the balance of what God wants us to experience in mercy and grace. So what does that mean? What is our side of the story in terms of the context of what we create for ourselves in the gospel? The first thing is this, is we have a tendency to live a life with mercy, but with no grace. So what does that look like? That means that when we come to this understanding of who Jesus is, we fully dive into the concept that Jesus covers our sin because of his death on the cross. We experience mercy, and we are grateful for that. But then something happens when we get on the other side of our, what we'd call our conversion, and we think in our minds, it can't be. It's too good to be true that really God graciously extends to me this gift of life and I can't do anything about it to earn it. It doesn't settle well with us. We're Americans, right? We earn our rights and we justify ourselves and think I have a right to this. So when it comes to grace, we don't know how to work with grace because we're always about earning things and making it about us. And so we struggle with grace. So we get mercy, but we don't get grace. And there's a term that's throughout the Bible, and there's a term that we can use today that would describe what that's called. It's called legalism, which means, yeah, Jesus covered my past, and I've experienced his mercy, but I got to work really hard. I got to make sure that I feel right before God, that I got to do something, and I make it happen. There's another term that's even more contemporary than legalism that falls into that category. It's called conservatism. Now, some people are already offended because you're a right-wing Republican. This has nothing to do with politics. This has to do with the practice of our life. And that is that we make this concept that, yeah, I know I, I, am, I am under God's mercy, but man, I got to make sure that I do things just right. And if I don't, God's going to squash me or he's going to send me to hell if I don't do things just right. So we work really hard. And when we work really hard, what ends up happening is we never experience the grace of God in our life. There's no peace. There's there's no resting in this reality of I'm in relationship with God, not because I've earned it, but because God has done something for me. And we work really, really, really hard at it. I remember when I was confronted with this, because this is something I know in my life and upbringing and going to church when I was young, that sometimes just accidentally gets ingrained in you. And so so then what begins to happen is you really start working in the realms of shame and guilt and condemnation, and you constantly feel like, I'm not good enough, I'm not good enough, I have to work harder. I was in, working for a relief organization in Hollywood, and uh, I was unloading a truck with one of my coworkers one day, and he had just come to know the Lord about six months to a year earlier. So he was one that really had experienced radical transformation. He was addicted to drugs, and overnight he was freed from drugs, and so he just had this passion for Jesus. But what began to happen is his passion for Jesus and his appreciation for God's mercy, he began to forget about the reality of God's grace in his life. So we're having a conversation as we're unloading this truck, and he says to me, he goes, hey, he goes, I want to really encourage you this Saturday. Uh, uh, there's a huge group of people, a bunch of Christians are getting together, and we're all going to an abortion clinic, and we're going to stand out front of the abortion clinic, and we're going to hold up signs about how abortion is wrong and how it's murdering babies, and if you're a good Christian, you'll be there too. Oh. When I heard that, I was like, and he starts telling me, he said, well, are you going to come? I'm like, well, I, I, I don't know. I, well, he, and he kept leaning into me saying, if you're not there, you're not there, then you're not a good Christian. You, do you even really know Jesus? As if knowing Jesus has to do with a, a protesting abortion. Now I know I'm already stepping on. Yes, I am pro-life. Don't worry about that, okay? But the sum total of our faith is not defined by our activity that we think will please God. And I remember I went home from that and I felt horrible. All for three days straight, I was questioning my faith because there's something in me that I didn't want to go and do that. And I thought, if I don't want to go and do that, does that mean that I don't value the unborn? No. Does that mean that I'm not following Jesus? No. And I had to come to this place to realize, no, Jesus loves me just the same whether I show up or if I don't show up. Because my standing with him is not based on my Christian activity. It's based on him. But so many times we go to the extreme And we forget about grace, which is a gift. It can't be earned. And we live in this this legalistic context. And what happens with legalism is it always leads to isolation. Because we become the judge of all people. And what happens when we become the judge of all people, we think when someone messes up, we push them away. We isolate them. We don't talk to them. We don't deal with them. Why? Because they're wrong or they're sinful, which is the opposite of the gospel. 
And what do we end up doing? We create this faith that is not the faith that God wants us to have. It's the faith that burdens people down with activities to justify themselves. It's exactly what's happening 2,000 years ago when Jesus came on the scene. The religious leaders had set up their faith, which was they took the law and they twisted it to make it something that was a burden on people to make themselves have to justify themselves before God. And this is what Jesus said in Luke chapter 11, verse 46, to these people. He says, you experts in the law, woe to you because you load people down with burdens they can hardly carry and you yourselves will not lift one finger to help them. Okay, honesty time. Anybody ever felt that faith is a burden? Anybody felt like you never add up? Okay, if you're a Christian, you're not raising your hand, we'll talk about lying because you and I, you're lying because we all felt that at one time or another, haven't we? We feel that burden. Where does that come from? It comes from a lack of understanding of grace. We got the mercy part, but we forgot the other side of the coin, which is grace, which is the next thing. The next thing is the, in the context of our story. So we have this understanding of mercy. We forget grace, but then we also go the other way. And that we have a life with grace with no mercy. What does that look like? Well, that looks like I don't really have to worry about my past because it's really, it's bad, but it's not as bad as other people. But man, I think God's got some great stuff going and I would love to have all of the benefits of what grace looks like, but I don't need to worry about my past. I don't have to be accountable for that. I don't even really need mercy. I just want all the good stuff that Christianity offers and all the things that God wants to give me. That's called license. There's another word that even probably takes it further. That's liberalism. So where conservatism makes legalism kind of the God of all things, liberalism makes license. I get to do whatever I want. Why? I'm under grace. Doesn't matter. I'm under grace. Someone who lives that way has forgotten they misunderstand mercy. What it took to get them to the context of grace of Jesus' payment on the cross is somehow marginalized. And they've forgotten what they, because when, when you experience mercy, you know what it does? It brings humility into your life to appreciate every gift that you get, because you realize where you've come from. But when we get to those two extremes, both of those end up in the wrong place. See, what happens is I was, uh, different from time to time, I was uh, listening to resources on counseling and things like that, and so I was listening to, a, uh, a, actually, a Christian psychiatrist talk about a counseling appointment she had with a young lady, and she was talking about how this young lady was describing the context that she lived in, and she was really struggling in a relationship that she was in. And so she said, well, tell me about the relationship. She said, well, she said, me and my boyfriend have been together for a long time, and she said, I really want to get married, but he's kind of pulled back on it, but I really want to be with him. So we moved in together, and we've been living together for about a year or so, and it's just not going very well. So she was explaining some more. So she's explaining, well, we're, we're kind of functioning like a married couple, but we're really not married, because but, but he doesn't really want to get married. But it's almost as good as marriage. She goes, but there's just something not right. He just doesn't seem to be as committed as I want him to be. And so she's listening to this, and she finally just stops her and says, you know, the problem is, is that you have given him everything and required nothing of him. You have given, him, given all of yourself to him with absolutely no commitment on his part. He has no reason to get married to you. Because you've given him everything that he thinks marriage is about, which primarily for a guy is sex. And if you're giving him that with no commitment, he's just going to keep living that way. What was happening is she was, in a sense, getting abused by him. She wanted a commitment, and he only wanted to use her for what he could get from her. Now, this is pretty strong, but when we forget about the reality of mercy in our life and only embrace grace, that's the same thing that we do to God. We just want what we can get from him, but we don't want to make any commitment to him because we just want what we want from him. Now, when we live in that, we, we forget that we don't just keep accessing God's grace because we sin more and we think, oh, just keep bringing it on, God. I'm just going to live my life the way I want to. Paul gives a pretty strong warning in Romans 6, 1 and 2. He says, what shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? How can we keep living that way? If we really understand God's mercy, if we're really living in his grace, something happens in us that it's not that we have to stop sinning to earn God's favor. We want to stop sinning because we realize what he's done for us. Completely different motivation. See, we, we become appreciative of God's grace, the gift that he gives to us when we realize the fullness of his mercy. When I was about 10 years old, my, my cousin and I thought it would be a great idea, don't ever do this. Great idea to play golf in his backyard with real golf clubs and real golf balls in a backyard that was probably like at its like longest or in its width was maybe 40 feet wide. It was a pretty small backyard. But one day, you know, when, when you're bored and you have nothing to do, you find things to do and to get in trouble, right? 
maybe, maybe you're not like me. So we went out of the backyard, and so he was the first one up, and we he threw the ball out of the grass. I said, all right, just kind of take a whack at it. And so he swings as hard as he could. He nails the ball, and it goes right across the, the backyard, and it hits the fence about that far down, just about a foot down, and just loud sound like, that was a great shot. So he goes, okay, your turn. So I throw the golf ball in, and I, just, I think I closed my eyes. It just swung as hard as I could. And I caught the ball clean, I mean, right off the grass. And it was soaring towards the fence, but my ball was a little bit higher than my cousin's ball, and it went, it cleared the fence by about a foot. And a split second after it cleared the fence, I heard the, the loudest crash I'd ever heard in my life. And then about a two-second delay, and then loud yelling and screaming from the other side of the fence. So my cousin and I looked at each other, we dropped the golf clubs, and we ran into the house. I mean, it's what you do when you're 10, right? So we ran into the house, we're hiding, and we could hear the neighbor coming. So we came outside the front, and he's coming out from his house, and he's screaming at us. He's got the golf ball in his hand, and he's almost charging us. And I'm, you know, I'm 10, I think my cousin was 8 or 9, and we're standing there, and he's coming at us. And when you're that small, and you're looking at a grown man, you are scared to death. I thought I was going to die. And so as he's coming at me, all of a sudden, it was almost out of nowhere, my grandpa steps right in front of us. And the guy kind of stops and takes a step back, and he goes, hey, what's going on here? And so he begins to explain with great detail and a few choice four-letter words to describe exactly what happened and that the golf ball came over. So what we didn't know is his backyard wasn't full of grass. He had built a shop off the back of his garage. He was in his shop working when the golf ball came right through the window. It scared him to death. So he was furious, and he was angry, and he was coming after us. And so my grandpa comes in and just says, listen, calm down. Calm down. And this is what my grandpa said. He said, listen, I'll go over, and I'm going to clean up all the broken glass. He said, I'm going to go to the hardware store. I'm going to get the right piece of glass for you. I'm going to replace it, and it'll be like it never happened. And the guy kind of took a step back and took a deep breath. He said, okay. And he walked away. I'm like, whew. I was close. And he did. That afternoon, it took my grandpa a couple hours. He went and cleaned up all the glass. Went to the hardware store, got a window, mounted it back in. It was like it never, ever happened. I so appreciated the fact of what my grandpa did because in my mind, honestly, as a 10-year-old, he saved my life because I thought my life was over. See, when you have that kind of appreciation for God's mercy, then you truly understand his grace. You can't fully embrace his grace unless you know what you've been saved from that you know that your life is being sustained because of God's mercy through Jesus, then grace is so much sweeter because you realize what could have been but isn't because of God's grace through Jesus and his mercy that he gave to us by his death on the cross. So, what's the answer to legalism? It's not more license. What's the answer to license? It's not more legalism because that's what we end up doing. What do we do? We go to the polar extremes and say, ah, I just need to push harder. I need to do more this way or more this way, and it doesn't work. What, what is the answer? It's mercy and grace together. That's the context. That's how God created us to be in relationship with him. What does that look like? So let's go back to verse 16. What is the context of our story in relating to God in this thing called the gospel? Mercy and grace married together in the way that we're supposed to relate to God. The first thing is this. It is confidence. A life with mercy and grace looks like confidence. It doesn't look like arrogance. It looks like confidence. The writer of Hebrews says, Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence. What does that mean? That means when I understand the fullness of Jesus' mercy for me and his death on the cross and the grace extended me and the gift of life that he gives me, that means when I come into relationship with God, I walk through the doors with a sense of confidence, not in what I have done for myself, but knowing fully what Jesus has done for me. I don't have to crawl in on my hands and knees and beg for mercy every day because God, through Jesus, has covered my sin and given me life, therefore I have a normal relationship with him. Not one that is constantly based on me thinking how much better do I have to be to go into relationship with God. But I get to walk into his presence with a sense of confidence. Because of something I did or because I'm special? No, because God did something for me that made it possible for me to live in that context. Because of the identity I have in Jesus, now I get to walk into the throne room of heaven with great confidence because God's wrath has been satisfied and poured out on Jesus, not on me. Therefore, there is nothing against me that God has because Jesus has taken care of it. Why is that so important? Because we constantly forget who we are. We forget the position that God has placed us in. He doesn't call us slave. 
He doesn't even call us sinner. He calls us sons and daughters. That's the identity he's given us. A slave enters into their master's quarters differently than a son or a daughter. And sometimes we think we're slaves and we come in and we forget God wants to relate to us. It's who we are. We've forgotten who we are. I've shared this story before, but for a different context. But when I was, uh, can't remember my exact age. I'm getting old, so I was younger, a lot younger. My family went to Texas for a two-week family camp. My dad was the speaker for two weeks in a camp, and a uh, huge camp in Texas. And the first night was so cool. My dad spoke, and there's tons of families there, lots of people. And so afterwards, we got into this long line to go to the snack bar and, and to get, get, some, you know, get something to drink and get some candy or whatever. And so we're waiting in this line. We get up to the front. And as soon as we stepped up to the counter, the person on the other side of the counter said, oh, just so you know, since you're the speaker for the next two weeks, your family and your kids gets anything they want for free. That was like the best moment of my life. Can you imagine what it would be like to have full access to as much soda you want to drink, as much candy you want to eat? All we had to do is walk up to the counter and say, hey, I'm an Amstutz. That's all we had to do. And they go, oh, okay. If, if that word got out, there would have been about 50 Amstutzes in that camp that week, but we kind of, we kept it quiet, but I would walk up, and I'd say, hey, I, my dad's the speaker, my last name, last name's Amstutz, they go, what do you want? So I'd order, and so I wouldn't just go once a day, I was going like three or four times a day, and constantly. In fact, it got to the point where they didn't even have to ask me who I was anymore. They knew who I was, because I'd walk up, oh, here he comes again, because I was just going to keep accessing that. Why? And the reason I was able to do that wasn't because anything that I did. It was because my dad was the camp speaker. My last name happened to be Amstead, so I had access to everything. Now, I know that you have to think about this, but just for a moment, think about the fact that God gives us grace, which is what? A gift. And that gift is access because we walk into his presence with confidence because what Jesus has done for us, and we have access to everything that he wants us to have to live the life he wants us to live. And so we, all we do is we walk in as a son or a daughter into his presence with confidence without running and hiding in fear of him. We respect him, we rever- reverence him, we honor him, but we aren't afraid and run the other way. Why? Because Jesus has covered our sin and given us a new identity. As we go on, you'll see why, how much more that important that is. Listen to 1 John chapter 4, verses 17 and 18. This is how love is made complete among us, that we may have confidence on the day of judgment in, the world we, in this world we are like Jesus. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. Fear has to do with what? Punishment. Who has been punished on our behalf? Jesus has. So when we relate to God, it's not, it's not in the context of punishment. It's because Jesus has already taken care of that. He satisfied that punishment for us. So what do we have? What's left? We have confidence. Second thing that's true of this life of grace and, or mercy and grace is acceptance. The writer says, let us approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace. Mercy. Remember I said earlier, what happens when we, when somebody's broken and we don't know how to give mercy, what do we do? We isolate them. We reject them based on their behavior. Because of what Jesus did on the cross, God doesn't do that. He doesn't reject people based on their behavior. We do it, but he doesn't do it because we don't understand mercy like he understands mercy. That means that because we can walk into this throne room with confidence, we can access the presence of God with confidence to what? Receive this mercy, which means God accepts me. Not because of me. Not because I'm great or I did something or I went and I protested. God doesn't accept me on that basis. He accepts me because what Jesus did for me. That means that that you can't do more to earn God's favor or less because it's his choice. His choice to accept you. Acceptance is one of the greatest needs of the human soul. It is. We don't do well with isolation. We don't. We want to be accepted by people. We want to be accepted by God. And I'll tell you on a personal level, this is probably one of the greatest struggles of my faith is understanding that God genuinely accepts me because he chose to do it and made a way through Jesus' death on the cross. I struggle with this. Because I forget sometimes that God wants to relate to me in the righteousness of Jesus, not the brokenness and guilt of my own sin. As a staff, every Monday when we meet for staff, the first thing that we do is we, 
we discuss scripture, we go through some different type of devotional together, and so we'll read through different portions of scripture, and we'll talk about what is God saying to you, and a few weeks ago, we were reading through Psalm 103, and as a pastor, I've read through Psalm 103 so many times, but it's like one of those things that the Holy Spirit just reminds you, you forget a verse is there, and I was reading Psalm 103, and I got to verse 10, it says this, talking of God, it says, he does not deal with us according to our sins or repay us according to our iniquities. Did you catch that? His primary mode of communication and connection with us is not based on our sin. Why is that significant? I know it is for me, and maybe this is just me, but I know my default is when I relate to God, I have to think of all the brokenness and the sin in my life before I can ever really access him that my default is usually guilt and shame and feeling like, oh, I just didn't match up. I wasn't a good enough pastor. I wasn't a good enough husband or dad or whatever it is. And so I have this overwhelming sense of weight that sometimes I carry. And every once in a while, God graciously says, hey, what, what are you doing? Why are you carrying that weight? That's not the context. I don't relate to you primarily on the basis of your sin. That's been taken care of because Jesus took care of it on the cross. Why are you still relating to me that way? And when I read that, I was like, oh, because I'll tell you, honestly, there are mornings when I, my alarm gets up, and I get up, and I'll, like, I just feel this weight come over me. Like, what do I have to do today to earn my right before God? Anybody want to admit you've ever felt that? That weight, and it's crushing. And then I read Psalm 103, verse 10, and God says, hey, 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 hey. That's not the way I relate to you. That's not the way our relationship works. Jesus took care of that. He cleared that debris field away, so now it's just his righteousness that represents you in this this context of acceptance that God chooses to accept us. And then the final thing about this life of mercy and grace is that it gives us access to riches. So we have confidence in our relationship with God, we have acceptance, and then we have what we don't even realize we have. It says, going on in verse 16, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. What is grace? Grace is a gift. So we have gifts that are given to us to help us in our time of need. What is the writer of Hebrews saying? He's saying this. He's saying you have been given all that you need to live a life that God purposed you to live, to live the life and to be the person that he created you to be. You have all of that. You don't need any more. You have access to it. Listen to some other scriptures that underscore this reality. 2 Peter 1.3 and the paraphrase called the message. Everything that goes into a life of pleasing God has been miraculously given to us by getting to know personally and intimately the one who invited us to God. Speaking of Jesus, the best invitation we've ever received. And then listen to what Paul says in Ephesians 2, 6 through 8. He says, and God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming age he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God. You and I are rich and don't even know it. We are. We, we have everything we need. Have we ever found ourselves crying out, to, uh, crying out to God for things that we don't even realize we already have? We forgot to go to the cupboard of his grace and access what he's already given us. He has. Those passages are telling us that in Jesus, his death and his resurrection and the deposit of his Holy Spirit in our lives, we have everything. You have every bit of patience that you're ever going to need in your life if you'll access it. You have every bit of wisdom that you're ever going to have in your life if you'll access it. You'll have every bit of compassion and love and mercy for other people if you'll access it. We have that. But we forget that we do. Would it be slightly frustrating if the day before you died, you found out that some relative passed away 30 or 40 or 50 years ago and left you $100 million, and the day before you die, you finally found that out? That would not be a good day. Well, dying would be even worse, but that would be pretty bad, wouldn't it? Knowing, not just now realizing as you look back over your life, I had $100 million. What could I have done with $100 million? I think there might be just a twinge of that when we come face to face with Jesus, and he says, man, Why did you struggle so many in the areas when the cupboard was full for you if you would have just opened the door and accessed it? Because I've given you through my grace everything you need if you'll access it. If you'll just access it. So we're going to head to communion in just a a few moments. In fact, worship team, you can kind of make your way up here and get in position for that. But I I wanted just to share as we prepare for communion something I think that really does capture this 
combination, this connection, this partnership between mercy and grace in our lives. And it comes through what we're about to experience in, in a few moments when you have a chance to go to one of the stations to receive the bread and the cup. Those are symbols of Jesus' body broken for us and then his blood shed, his death for us that covers us by his mercy and then extends God's grace of gift, gifts to us. So if you've ever seen any form or read any form of Les Miserables, you will understand the context. It's been in play form, multiple movies, and in print. The story really follows a theme of understanding mercy and grace in tandem with each other. So in one of the early scenes of the film or the play, as Jean Valjean is released from prison, one of the, he's the main character, he finds his way into a priest's home, and the, night that, the first night that he stays there, he decides to steal some silver from the priest, and then he leaves. The next day, he's captured by the police, he's arrested, he's brought back to the priest's home, and they have him and the sack with all of the stolen goods in it, and they bring him into the priest, and they say, hey, we caught this guy, and he had this bag of silver, and he had the audacity to say that he didn't steal it from you, but that you actually gave it to him. And in that part, if you, whatever f version you've seen, there's this pause, and the priest is looking at Jean Valjean in handcuffs and the bag of his guilt in front of him and the police who've arrested him, and he looks at the police and he says, of course I gave it to him. And he said, the only thing that disappointed me was that he forgot to take the candlesticks too. And he walks over to the table and takes these two beautiful silver candlesticks and he opens the bag that already has all his other silver and he puts it in and he said why did you leave without these and in that moment the police unlock the shackles on Jean Valjean and he's standing now it's just him and the priest just the two of them and the priest in so many words says back to, to Jean Valjean he says listen he said I have purchased your life I have bought your soul with this silver and he said and now I give you back to God that is such a powerful statement because it's the same statement that Jesus made on the cross when he died for our sin and our brokenness and extended mercy to us. Then he says to us, I now give you back to God. I reconcile you back to God so that now because you've experienced my mercy, now you can live in the grace of God in a relationship where you have access to everything that you need. You not only get the silver that you tried to steal, you get the candlesticks too. You get everything that you need. And in a moment, as you, you have a chance to receive communion, I'm going to encourage you. There are places and moments and things in your life that you know you need to allow God's mercy to cover. There's things that you're carrying with you right now that they still have a hold on you because you have yet to fully embrace the mercy of God through Jesus' death. That thing that holds you, that thing that heaps guilt and shame upon you is the very thing God wants to break in your life but you have to access it. And then the other side of the coin, there's some of you here today, you're like me. And I know when I come to communion, one of the reminders God gives to me is you are saved by grace. I have unconditionally loved you and accepted you because of what Jesus did for you. So walk in that freedom. Lift the weight off of your performance or your behavior having to be good enough and just enjoy the relationship that I've created you to have. Let's close our eyes. Lord Jesus, in these next moments as we come to these stations. In fact, you will be, well, uh, you will be uh, able to access those as the worship team goes back in. Just go to the table as you like and just spend time allowing God to speak to you. And so, Lord Jesus, as we do this today, I pray that you would, for maybe some of us, we've never come to know you. Maybe we've never understood fully what mercy and grace looks like. For today, for the first time, it's become clear. And we desire to make the commitment because of your mercy to experience the fullness of your grace. But for each of us, Lord, if it's mercy, if it's grace, if it's those married together, Lord, would you allow us to open up the cupboard of your resource and access all that we need right now in this moment to be fully who you created us to be, to be in right relationship with you, to experience the freedom and the weight being lifted off of us and be in the fullness of your mercy and grace with confidence, acceptance, and the riches that you give to us. We thank you, Jesus, in your name. Amen.